Way back in 2000, I was a bored 15-year-old girl and began exploring AOL chat rooms. I had recently left public school and moved to a new city that I'd never more than passed through, and so I was a bit lonely. I thought it would be cool if I could link up with people around my age in my new area. I've always been very cautious with my personal info, so I wasn't too worried about anything bad happening. I ended up meeting my boyfriend through one of the chat rooms. Things moved pretty quickly after that, and I was soon pregnant and we were engaged. We got our own place and life was good. We still used to aim message each other when he was at work, and frequently we would also chat with our friends in the chat rooms. Some of my old online contacts would message me from time to time, but honestly, I mainly chatted with people I knew in real life. When our son was about six months old, we moved into a larger apartment. My fiancé Jake began working long shifts, and so I was home alone a lot with the baby. One evening, I was in a chat with a friend when somebody else sent me an IM. I wasn't sure who it was, but she began casually chatting with me, and it seemed remotely normal, at least at first. I was still confused as to who this was, and so she sent me a photo. She didn't look familiar. I continued the conversation because I started to think maybe my fiancé and a friend were just messing with me, because he liked to joke around like that. After a bit of dull, awkward conversation, and my refusing to allow them to view my webcam, this person sends me a photo of a middle-aged man. Confused, I ask who it was and why they sent it. They gave me some line like, Oh, that's my friend John. Don't you think he's handsome? I immediately knew that this wasn't right or a joke from anyone I knew. It was clear that I'd been messaged by this guy all along, pretending to be another teenage girl. Initially, I cut off contact, but after a couple of days of thought, I was creeped out enough to actually call and cancel my AOL service. A week or so after this, my brother-in-law, Mark, and his wife, Lynn, moved in with us. It was early evening on a Friday, and Mark, Lynn, and I were getting some food and drinks ready before Jake got home. I was in the kitchen, and Mark was just a few feet away in the living room with Lynn. We were chatting and laughing when the phone rang. I answered the line in the kitchen. It was a man, and he greeted me by my first name in a very creepy tone, and seemed to be trying to keep his voice low. I had that feeling in the pit of my stomach that something was very wrong. I asked him, Who is this? Mark took notice and asked me who it was. He must have noticed the change in my tone, because he glanced at me and then went straight into his room to pick up the other line and listen. The man on the phone must have heard Mark, because he then said to me, Well, I see you have company, in a pretty disgruntled tone. He quickly hung up. I didn't have caller ID at the time, so we dialed star 69 to get the number. When I tried calling it back, though, it was a hotel in a neighboring city about 15 minutes away. I asked the clerk who answered about the phone call I had received, but they informed me that there was no way to tell what room it was placed from. I knew that it hadn't been anyone I knew. My phone line was only active for a couple of months at that point, it was listed under my name, but I'd only given it out to family and a few close friends. We didn't know what to make of it as the night went on, it was quickly forgotten. The next week came and went. I'd received a couple of calls from blocked numbers where no one responded, but I tried to convince myself that I was simply worrying too much and that it was no big deal. We prepared for another weekend hanging out together. Again, Mark, Lynn, and I were home, and Jake was still at work. We needed a few things from the store, so Mark volunteered to go get them, while Lynn and I stayed with the kids. Now, the small building we lived in had three apartments on the lower level, 
side by side and three units above on the upper level, kind of like a motel. Our unit was the last to the right on the lower level and the furthest from the parking lot. When you exit our apartment to make your way to the parking lot, you walk down a cement walkway and past the lower two apartments. When you get to the end of the building, there's an area between the deck staircase to the upper level in the building where a couple of bicycles were stored. This is the only residential property in that area, and the surrounding businesses and offices were closed at this time in the evening. Mark exited the apartment, but came running back in just a few minutes later. He asked me if I was expecting more company. When I told him no, he told me this. When he had begun walking past the other apartments into the lot, a man dressed in dark clothing with a hood on had snuck out of the bicycle area and began walking towards our apartment with his head down. Once he noticed Mark coming straight towards him though, he turned and ran. Mark chased him into the lot, but the guy took off and into the darkness and he lost him a few moments later. We all just sat nervously for a few minutes, because we were all thinking the same thing. It was the man who'd called me, and that man was the girl from the chat room. I have no clue how he would have found out my number, unless maybe I'd given it to someone previously thinking that they were someone else but it was really him. I don't know how advanced people's hacking skills were back then in 2000, and if they could have found out my info through my AOL service, but I definitely regretted chatting away my boredom. After this, we moved to a different town, and I never listed a landline number in my name again, and definitely never went back to those chat rooms. This story has a lot of build-up. So I met this friend online the summer before my junior year of high school. I was 16 at the time. His name was Flip, and we clicked pretty much instantly. Our senses of humor matched up, and I felt like we were really good friends. He was a guy and I was a girl, but I never really held any romantic feelings. Also, I was in a relationship. When I was 16, he was 19. I could tell that he had romantic feelings, and he let me know six months into our friendship that he loved me. We didn't really have a stable friendship, as he flipped out a lot and would go on extended amounts of time without talking to me. He told me it was because he couldn't bear to talk to me knowing we can't be together, but I know now that it was more of a control thing and he wanted to stop talking to me to make me feel like I was missing something. He really hated women, really, really disliked them, and felt like most of us are just whores. He told me he felt like I was different, and that I was the only true woman he's ever met. Really a red flag there. I was young, so I didn't really think much of it. Our friendship was only online, after all. Eye messaging and FaceTiming. Now when he went on these tangents where he would abruptly stop talking to me, he would go on Twitter and make offensive demonizing tweets about me to people. Awful stuff. When he came back, I would just kind of ignore that stuff, because he would go right back to being funny and nice. He also had a habit of lashing out at people, taking revenge on people, and just wanted to make people feel like shit for fun. I thought I was special and that he really cared about me, but would never do anything like that to me. I remember leading up to my 18th birthday, him being 21 now, he said to me, when you're 18 you're sending me nudes, you don't get to say no. I brushed it off because I knew that I wouldn't, but yeah, notice there's an element of him wanting to dominate. Anyway, fast forward two years later, I'm 18 now, a freshman in college, in October, I broke up with my boyfriend, and Flip took that as an opportunity. He would tell me he couldn't bear not seeing me, and that basically we have to meet or it's all over. I didn't really have romantic feelings for him. My love for him was platonic, but I figured I'd try the romance. I couldn't stand the thought of losing him, so I impulsively bought a plane ticket to where he lives in December. 
my parents had no idea, and to this day they still don't. I was going to go away on a Friday, come back on a Monday. The college I go to is in a city with an airport, so it was easy to just take an Uber over there. This romance that I'm trying to project feels real, and I genuinely felt like I loved him romantically. Leading up to the flight, I started to get cold feet. I was questioning the legitimacy of these forced feelings, and started getting on with a guy in a neighboring uni. I started catching feelings for him, and kissed him a day before my flight. At that point, I had decided that I didn't want to pursue Flip romantically. I figured, hey, we've been friends for two years. When I get there, I'll tell him I only want to stay friends. He'll be upset, but I'm sure our friendship is mirth more than that, and we'll have a nice, enjoyable time together. How naive I was. I decided to go on the trip anyway, thinking that maybe seeing him would reignite that fire. Upon arrival, I realized that I didn't love him at all and was no longer attracted to him. Regardless, though, he was a very close friend of mine for a very long time, and whether I felt a romantic connection or not, I wanted to meet him for the sake of meeting him. Just how I would want to meet any internet friend. So it's time for the flight. It's very early. I remember sitting on the plane contemplating walking out. I wanted to just leave and not return. I had a weird feeling, and I should have listened to my gut. I arrive and go outside the terminal. I see him sitting in his car, just staring at me. A very malicious, piercing stare. After a few moments, he gets out of the car, but he looks different. It's strange, because we've FaceTimed before and I've seen pictures of him, but he just looks different. Kind of creepier. We sit and hug in the car. It was awkward, and I feel awkward. We make small talk and awkward jokes, and in that moment I wanted to just be back in my dorm. We go back to his apartment and go up to his room. We smoke some weed and I lay down on his bed to sleep. When I wake up, he's spooning me and trying to follow me. I take his hands off and tell him to stop. Then I sit up and basically unload about how I don't want him romantically, only as a friend. He just started crying and begging me to tell him I love him. I tell him I can't do that. He stands up and drops crying, goes to the bathroom and starts randomly lighting things on fire. It smells like burning paper in the bedroom now. He comes out normally like nothing happened, and sits on his computer and starts playing video games without talking to me. The rest of the trip, it's just a combination of him being kind and normal one moment, and then being completely evil the next. Some of the things he's said and done throughout the three days are making jokes about me dying, pretending to hit me and getting close enough to watch as I flinched telling me he'd send a snap of me to my mom with a geotag of his town so I would get in trouble. Telling me he would do weird things to me while I was sleeping. Telling me to shut the fuck up when I would speak or ask questions, in front of his roommates and friends, too. He was trying to feel me up in bed and I kept pushing his hands away, and he would keep trying and say things like, I know you want it, you're just holding back. He even fed me spaghetti that he said he made purposely with mold, hoping I would get sick. So basically, I kept my cool, and when he would tell me these things, I would nod and agree and laugh with him. I was scared, and wanted nothing more than to leave. So I kind of kept it cool and spent my time trying not to upset him. Monday rolls around, and my flight wasn't until 8pm. Around 11am, he goes downstairs to leave. And in that time, I pack my bag and leave without him knowing. My plan of action is to run to the nearest shopping plaza and Uber to the airport from there. I wasn't about to Uber from his house. I'm almost to the end of the street, feeling free, when I feel two arms come up from behind and wrap around me. He's hugging me. He mumbles something into my ear and then turns around, and dead on sprints down the street to his apartment. I ran to the shopping plaza and called an Uber, and got out. It felt so much relief in that moment. It felt like I was free. I waited at the airport with nothing to do for eight hours, but better being there than here. 
I look back and feel like an idiot. Maybe I should have gone to a hotel and probably should have left, but I'm a broke college kid and I was already scared being there without my parents' knowledge. After I left, I blocked him on every social media outlet I have, including LinkedIn. He still has tried to contact me regularly for months, but luckily I've never told him my address or anything. Hi all. Second time poster here, and I've been meaning to get this up for the past few days. This happened over the past month, and finally came to a peak last Friday. For some backstory, I'm a recovering high-functioning alcoholic. Eighth months sober, and I fell off the wagon once. It's been three months since then. I'm also a doctor. I run a business and have a few patients sent to me from the Hospital Behavioral Health Center, the courthouse-mandated cases, and the local university's counseling center. About three months ago, around the same time I fell off the wagon, I was going through a big malpractice suit from a woman who was angry that I had testified against her in family court, leading her to lose custody. She made up lies, so we won and the suit was dropped. Easy enough, in theory. August is when the story starts. At the beginning of the month, I sent my assistant and my secretary home early, because it was Friday and pretty beautiful out. Patients were done for the day, so I stayed back to finish some notes, and around 6pm I finished up and began to lock up the building. Suddenly, I felt something odd, like the heebie-jeebies or something, so I looked up and around, but I didn't notice anything. Walking around the side of my building to my car, though, I noticed a tall, very skinny man standing at the sidewalk, staring directly at me. He had a baseball cap covering his face, jeans and a tee. When I saw him staring, he turned and ran. It was on, but nothing to get my panties in a twist for. I went on home and thought of nothing else. That night... The alarm went off at my building around 3 a.m. My husband was still awake reading, so he went with me to meet the police. Usually no big deal. It can trip over several things. When I got there, though, the word devil was written in red paint all across the side of the building. The camera showed that same tall man doing it, but I hadn't seen his face well enough to give a description. My friend and handyman named Mike came the next day and took care of it, citing that it was probably just a prankster, since my office isn't the most amazing of neighborhoods. Work where you're needed, right? Nothing happened until the following Wednesday. I was leaving late, since I take uninsured patients after hours on sliding scale this day, around 10pm. I came out, and all of my tires were slashed on my car. I called service, and my husband came to get me. I was spooked at this point, but still not shaken. The next day, I get my mail out of the bin, and there was a box with no return address on it for me. I open the package. It's pictures of me, at the grocery store, at a barbecue on my porch at home, getting out of my car at my child's school. Worst of me at the bar drinking when I had fallen off the wagon the previous months before. Probably at least 50 of them. I immediately called my husband, my lawyer, and the police. They took my statement and the box. Completely freaked out, I decided to take the rest of the week off and do my appointments from Skype at home. The next day, Friday, I was setting up my laptop in our sunroom and getting my stuff ready. I go back in to refill my teacup with water, and when I come back out, the same man is standing outside the room, which is completely glass all the way around, staring in at me. I dropped my cup and screamed, and ran inside. He started banging on the front door, and ringing the bell over and over. I called 911, and after what felt like forever, what was probably just a few minutes later, it suddenly stopped. The police came and took my description now, but found nothing and no one. My husband came home early, 
and at this point I was completely terrified. All went quiet for the next week or so. I returned to work with protection from Mace and my employees, so I was never alone, and I thought everything would be fine until Saturday came. I had a basketball game for my son and my husband coaches. I agreed to bring some cupcakes and pizza for the team because it was their last game. About three-fourths of the way in, I stepped out to go grab the party supplies from my car. When I opened the door, though, I noticed that something was off. The smell. Things moved around. Maybe some combination. When I opened the trunk, I realized that my car had been broken into, and my spare keys were taken from my purse that I'd stupidly, I know, please don't judge locked in my trunk before the game. I panicked. I ran in and grabbed my husband to tell him. He of course criticized me for leaving my purse in the trunk and told me to call Mike ASAP since my house key was on the set. I call Mike and he says he can be there at 6 p.m. to change the locks. Fine, right? I settle down a little and we finish with the boys. After lunch and a couple of errands, we head home. Immediately upon pulling into the driveway, I hear our dogs going crazy. My husband comes inside first, and then tells me to come in. We watch the nest camera, and see someone trying to come into the house but unable to get in, because our Great Danes and Shepherd nearly bit him when he stepped in. Evidently, my husband had forgotten to set the alarm when we left that morning in a rush. At least we're equally stupid between me with the purse and him with the alarm. I called my friend who's the chief of police in the neighboring city and asked what could be done. They hadn't made any arrests and I was getting more afraid by the day. He called around and got some police surveillance of my office in the house. This seemed to settle things down, at least until last Friday. I was alone in the house because my boy and husband had gone on a camping trip with some friends. My friend and my sister were supposed to come by at around 8 and I decided to take a nap for a bit before they got there. I guess about 40 minutes had passed when I hear my dog start barking. I realize there's some sort of commotion going on outside. Police lights. I peek out the window. In my yard, I see my neighbor, a young man I've watched grow up, and several police officers taking down this tall, lanky man on the ground and handcuffing him. I go out and my neighbor proceeds to tell me they were driving by on watch duty when they saw this man trying to break into my house. The police found tape, a knife, and several types of drugs on his person. He confessed to being set up to scare me and hurt me by the woman I'd testified against. He claimed he wasn't going to kill me, but the investigation is ongoing, as this just happened last week. Before we begin, let me give you a little description about myself. I'm a 20-year-old college student who's been back home for the summer. I also happen to be extremely small, 4 foot 11 to be exact, 105 pounds and a serious case of noodle arms, literally zero muscle. Now let's get to the story. Last night at around 8.30 p.m., I was walking the dogs with my mom. I have two dogs. Daisy and Major. Daisy is our senior. She's 13 years old and she has bad arthritis because her torso is too heavy for her stubby legs. We make it a point not to take her on long walks anymore because of this. Before we even made it to the main street, Daisy goes to the bathroom right away. I tell my mom she can go ahead and go back home while I take Major with me for a long walk. My mom was hesitant about this, and at first she refused. However, I know my mom has some work she has to get back to. Eventually, I convinced her to go back. I said it was just a short walk, and I have our German Shepherd mix major to protect me. Finally, she agrees to go back, but tells me to be careful and to make sure no one is following me. A little bit weird and specific, but I agree nonetheless. Now, I should add that I didn't have my phone on me at the time. It was about to die before our walk, so I let it charge at home. 
I was still confident because I'd walked the dogs on the street numerous times before and never had an issue. From there, I turned left from the street we live on onto the main road. This made it so the traffic going in the opposite direction would be closest to me. Every building on the main street is some sort of doctor's office. All of them are closed at this time, and the parking lots are all empty. I walked for a bit on the left side before deciding to cross over to the right side of the street where the dental office is, which was past the vet. Before I could do that, though, there was a car approaching on my side of the street. I waited patiently for him to pass before walking across. As I'm walking across, I take note that the car that passes me is red, and I stop just before the dentist's parking lot. Usually I go behind the dentist's office, but last night I hesitated and after a full minute of Major sniffing around at nothing of interest, I decided against it and just walked past, opting to go the long way back home instead. Not 30 seconds after I decided not to walk that direction, a car pulls into one of the two entrances of the dentist parking lot and parks in a parking spot. I've never seen anybody pull into a parking lot on this street so late at night before, so I'm immediately suspicious and stare back behind me. I was checking to make sure it wasn't the same red car from a minute ago. Another 30 seconds goes by, and the car pulls out from the parking space and jerks back to the other entrance, the one closer to me. It then pulls just far enough out for me to see that it is in fact the same red car. I still couldn't conclude that he was following me just yet, so I tried to remain calm and kept staring as I continued to walk away so he'd know I was aware of his presence. Just before the end of the block I'm on, I pull Major and I off the sidewalk. That's when the car swerves from the lot and beelines towards where I was. I pull us even further away from the sidewalk and behind a tree that Major decides to mark, completely oblivious. The red car was about to pass me when it begins to slow its pace where Major and I am. I was still standing behind the tree glaring at the car through the branches. The car eventually moved past me instead of coming to a complete stop where I was. I take the initiative to immediately change my trajectory and walk back the way I came, tugging Major's leash with urgency. My hope of him simply continuing down the street died when he immediately took a hard left and swerved into the parking lot across from me. He noticeably accelerates across the lot as he turns his car to face the main street with his headlights on me. By now, my adrenaline had kicked in, and I had become extremely upset and flushed to show for it. Not only was he following me, but he was driving erratically and trying to scare the living shit out of me. Keep in mind that there's nobody else driving on the main street. I thought that I was effectively alone, until I see a silhouette walking towards me on my side of the street. I couldn't be sure because it was so dark out, but I thought it could be my mom. She has a short stature like me, but it was hard to tell from this distance. If not her, it could be someone taking a walk. If not that, it could be someone on foot trying to trap me. Even so, I continued towards them to see if it really was her. Just then, the car accelerates again and pulls into a parking lot, adjacent to the one he was just in. I start quickening my pace, when finally the vet's light flickers on and illuminates my mom's face just enough for me to recognize her. Mom? I called out, as I quickly turned my head again to watch the red car repeat its pattern of turning into the next lot and basing themselves towards the street, now occupied by me and my mom. Yeah, it's me, she reassured, although distracted. She too was eyeing the strange red vehicle as she waited for me to catch up with her. I was a little dismayed to see that she didn't seem to be carrying her phone on her. Nonetheless, when I got in the earshot of my mom, I vehemently stated that there was a fucking maniac on the loose. To my surprise, my mom says, I know. The man was about to repeat his crazed cycle when I finally get to see what he looks like. He must have put down his window at some point, because I could see his side profile as he drove his car an inch away from the street once more. Except, he wasn't looking at us. 
the curly bearded man was looking at his car dash as weird beeping noises emanated from his car. I had to actively fight the urge not to yell at the man to get lost. The driver became even more erratic. He pulled into the next parking lot and pulled out, just as quick into another lot on the next block. We took that opportunity to cross the street back towards our house, but that also brought us closer to him. He must not have expected us to cross, though, because he drove far enough ahead to allow us to pass him from behind. This gave us a good view of his bumper as he paused in the middle of the lot. That was the last place we saw him. His license plate read CMMJ65. We were now in the home stretch. I wasn't looking back as often at this point. I just wanted to get home. My mom, however, said she saw him turn around again to face our street. He may have kept watching us from there, but we have no way to be sure. My mom then explained to me that when she got Daisy back inside, she told my stepdad to feed her because she had to run back outside to get me. She said this whole time she walked back home, she couldn't shake this bad feeling about me. She just had to go back out and make sure I was okay. Then she got to see for herself how this deranged driver was swerving in and out of lots behind me and across from me. Once we made it home, we reported the incident to the police. We gave the license plate number and described what had happened. The dispatcher even commented on how weird the situation was. I don't want to know what the guy was thinking. I'm happy my mom had the crazy intuition to find me. I don't know what I would have done to get myself home otherwise. The rest of that night, I spent it awake, wondering what I could have done better in that situation. I was afraid that if I had tried to run, it would have provoked him and he'd try to chase me and there wouldn't have been any way to outrun it. I wonder what would have happened had I gone from behind the dentist before I decided not to. I don't like thinking about it. My mom thinks the noises coming from his car might have been some sort of police radio. That's another terrifying thought. What is up guys, Blue Spooky here as always. I uh, just wanted to thank you guys so much for watching, especially if you made it this far to the end of the video. Uh, I have a little bit of an update here for you guys. I uh, recently started streaming a little bit on Twitch. Uh, I don't know if you guys are interested in just hanging out and seeing a bit of gameplay of maybe Monster Hunter or some games like that, maybe a few horror games, but uh, I'll leave a link to my Twitch in the description of the video below. As always, uh, if you guys like the video, please leave a comment or perhaps uh, like or subscribe if you feel so inclined. If you'd like to message me or you'd like to send in a story for me to read or you have a suggestion for a story I should read, the links to all of my social media will be in the description of the video below as well. This includes my Facebook, Twitter, Gmail, and now of course my Twitch account. Uh, go ahead and send me a message on any of those and I'll try to get back to you as soon as possible. But uh, please guys be patient because I do get a lot of messages so if I don't respond to you right away within like a week or two ju just be a little patient I'll get to it as soon as I can. If you do decide to send in a story uh, please be sure to include in the description of the email or message what the name of the story is, what the category of the story is, and how you would like to be credited in the video that the story appears in. Uh, if you guys are curious about the music used in this video uh, links to the music and the order in which the music appears will always be in the description below the video, so you can go ahead and check that out there. Uh, last but not least, if you guys do enjoy my content, please uh, take a look at my Patreon, and if you feel so inclined, maybe donate like a dollar or something. Every little bit helps. Uh, it'll never be necessary, but of course, it's always an option if you guys would like to support the channel. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching, and I hope you guys have a wonderful day.